Welcome back, everybody, to Data Art Conversations with Sports Betting Industry Leaders. Today is Episode 9, From the Odds Desk to the Racetrack, How NASCAR is Building an Engaging Sports Betting Experience. And today, we're lucky enough to be joined by Ray Cook, Senior Manager, Sports Betting at NASCAR. And as always, I'm joined by Kevin Twitchell, Advisor here at Data Art. Great. Thank you for joining us here today. Um, as we always do, let's just kind of start off with uh, really who you are, where you came from, how you wound up at NASCAR. Just a little experience of yours would be great. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be joining you both. Uh, I appreciate the time. Um, like you said, my name is Ray Cook. I'm originally from Omaha, Nebraska, uh, smack dab in the middle of the country. Um, my uncle was actually in the sports betting business um, in a, a small capacity. And so ironically, I grew up, my first job I ever wanted, even when I was like eight years old, was to be an odds maker. Um, I didn't even know if it was a real job, but I always thought like, you know, making the betting lines on games was super cool. Uh, ever since I was a kid, I, I used to look at the paper and we we get the paper every Sundays and look at the spreads and I would circle which teams for NFL games I would be on on that side of the spread and compare it to a notebook that I had on what I thought the spread should be, um, which was just very base level, no no data or analytics behind it at eight years old. But um, so I always knew that I had a passion for the industry and just sports in general. Um, growing up, baseball was my favorite sport. I knew every reliever, basically every player. Um, I've always been super into prospects and, and minor leagues and, and stuff like that. So I always knew that I wanted to be in sports. I, I played baseball growing up and, and boxed as well. Um, ultimately, I went to college for journalism. Originally, I went to the University of Nebraska at Omaha. Uh, I went there for sports journalism and was the sports editor for my college newspaper there while also working for the athletic department, um, doing social media, digital media interviews, um, on-camera work and stuff like that. Um, post-grad, I went to Ohio University, where I got a dual master in business administration and my master in sports administration, um, which kind of helped solidify that I wanted to work in the industry, but didn't exactly know um, in what capacity. Luckily, once Passbook got revealed, I you know knew that it was the perfect time to kind of go down that original career path that I wanted to go and, and try and be an odds maker. And so um, I interviewed with DraftKings Sportsbook um, and was lucky enough to uh, receive a job offer to be a trader there. Um, started in June of 2021, I believe, um, upon graduation and um, started there. It was a great experience. I was there for a year. Really right off the bat, they asked, you know, what what kind of sports I was interested in. And uh, NASCAR was one that I, I bet on a lot and, and grew up watching um, a little. But, you know, during COVID, that even got more enhanced with the fact that it was one of the only ones um, still going. So um, developed kind of a, a stronger passion for NASCAR and told them that NASCAR was one of my favorite sports. So uh, they kind of gave me free reins to take over the team and 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 do a lot of the pricing aspects of, of that stuff. And so I did that for about a year, um, developed a relationship with my boss, who's a great guy named Joe Solosky, um, who was working with NASCAR at the time. Um, and, and we kind of built a relationship, I would say, that started as like both a, a passion for NASCAR and, and growing markets. When I started at DraftKings, I saw that NASCAR had five, six markets um, that were able to be bet on each week. Um, and I, I saw that there was a huge opportunity, you know, as, as, a, as a trader and an odds maker to enhance that growing market and give fans more, more things to bet on. And so that's kind of where Joe and I crossed paths at first. Um, and then ultimately after a year, um, a position opened up and he reached out to me and, um, we talked about it and I, I, I made the transition to where I am now, which is the, the senior manager of sports betting at NASCAR. Excellent. Thank you. It's a very, uh, concise, uh, <laughs> background. Um, oh, can you, can you explain what a trader does, uh, you know, a DraftKings or, or, or any sports book? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the, I preface it by saying one of the most interesting things is that it's a very, very new industry. And so it, it's rapidly changing. But at the at the base of it, a trader is managing risk for a sports book, um, whether that be making odds, um, developing odds, or odds already being created and looking at, you know, bets that are coming in, action handle, whether that be sharps or uh, regular new customers. And learning based on that sports books trading strategy, how to move lines to adjust um, limits of players and, and, and stuff like that. So I would say, you know, the base of it is, is managing risk. 
um, I would say is, is the biggest component of it. It can get down to making odds for sports, um, developing new markets, um, in play trading. So, which was one of the most fun things that you can do as a trader is and when an NFL game is going on is, is you're live trading it, um, not coming up with the lines, but kind of managing those as a model is usually producing those um, and adjusting those based on action and prior knowledge and experience as well. So um, I would say that is is what a trader kind of encompasses at this point. Understood. And I think we'll get into the technology of, you know, uh, or, or the technical tools that you use you know, to, to manage risk and, and, and keep track of all that data. Uh, but one thing uh, that kind of sparked my interest when we, you know, spoke kind of behind the scenes before, uh, you know, we gather here today is, uh, you know, around the, uh, you know, misconception of you know, what a nods maker is and, and their role, um, you know, at, at a sports book. Uh, you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, well, I think I think we've all heard that, like, Vegas knows everything. Um, I think that that's what a lot of, of betters kind of think. Uh, when they think of betting is like, oh, Vegas is so much smarter than us in some ways that I would say is true, um, but not in the sense that the the narrative is being spread. The other thing that is important to note about like odds makers in the, in the U.S. landscape is that it's so, so new. Um, there wasn't there wasn't really a, a background that you could you know major in in college to to learn how to be an odds maker. Um, it's kind of a mix of different skill sets that you have to have. What we've seen is that a lot of traders and odds makers are in the U.S. have transitioned from being ticket writers and working in the casino industry in, in Vegas and New Jersey and various you know places like that into being a trader, which doesn't, in my opinion, directly correlate to um, being a good odds maker, a, a good trader. But um, I think the misconceptions are, are, like I said, that that Vegas knows everything when, in fact, a lot of odds makers are just like the public. Uh, that are betting um, and use the same tools, same information, same data sets um, to look at those. And maybe just on not a higher level, but maybe a deeper level, right? Because it's it's your job if, if you're doing it for eight hours plus a day, um, you're going to know a lot about that. So, you know, taking the NFL, uh, for example, um, it's not that Vegas knows more. I would say I think it's a a, a misconception of the odds makers are more in tune and aware with player values and stuff like that. I think that um, there's a big difference with, with public and sharp betters and how they kind of process and, and think about information. Um, for example, like when a quarterback's out, I think the public way overvalues how much that quarterback is worth to the mm-hmm. spread. Yeah. Whereas sharps and odds makers will know that um, it is such a team game, especially in the NFL that, you know, <clears throat> even a quarterback being out can, can move the, the point spread as little as two to three points and, and stuff like that. And, you know, a max of six to seven, maybe. So I think that that's like a big misconception. Um, but, you know, overall, I think the, the, as betters, you know, and, and a better myself and coming from a better background, like you, you think that like it's you versus the odds makers and, and it is, but it's not, it doesn't have to be this uh, negative uh, relationship where it's like, they know things that I don't know, which is couldn't be further from the truth because it's all, public information. And I think you're seeing that now with some of the markets that come out, like in the trading room, we react to breaking news, just like the public does. And if you get on top of that breaking news before the odds makers, then like you'll have an edge on, on certain markets that should, shouldn't be up or should be taken down and stuff like that. So I think, you know, in essence, we're just a lot more similar than you think um, between odds makers and, and the, the betting public. Yeah. Yeah, and one thing that I, I hear, uh, you know, often from, uh, you know, fellow, you know, uh, sports betters is, uh, oh, that line looks fishy, you know, like, like they, they think like, yeah, so, somebody is out to get them because that line doesn't look like what they think it, sh- it should look like. But like, as you said, you know, you're just using the data information available to, you know, to set the lines. Yeah, I think and I we think, have that the the perception of the guy in the back room, you know, with like you said, your uncle with a notebook, you know, and that stack of paper and a cigar, you know, making these odds. But I think you know, looking at you and hearing you and your experience at DraftKings, it's obviously a sophisticated business right now, and getting more sophisticated. <clears throat> so when you're 
at DraftKings and now in your new role, how important is that perception of, you know, from the guy with the notebook to now technology and, you know, how important is technology and like, especially real-time data uh, to help you make your, your decisions? Yeah. Well, I, I don't want to speak for the entire industry. Uh, I would say that like, just based off of my experiences with DraftKings, but what I like am confident in saying is that it's a very uh, new marketplace in the U S and it, it's been a lot more mature in Europe. And so I think a lot of the sports books and, and companies that kind of own them have taken the European model and brought it to the U S which has kind of given them a much more um, mature mindset on, on those things. But the real-time data is, is massive. Um, and like the, the fishy lines, I would say, I think it's really just a discrepancy between like what the public the majority of the public might think. And then what you'll learn is that sharps and odds makers yeah. are usually on the same side. And I think a lot of that comes down to like, you think about primetime games, interdivision games with, I remember a game last year where it was like, uh, it was the Rams, it was the 49ers at the Rams, or no, no, it was the Rams at the 49ers. I think the spread was three and a half and it didn't move all week. It opened there and the public was just hammering the Rams. But I know that, a lot of the sharps in the industry were on the 49ers plus three and a half and, and money line as well. And it's one of those, those instances where you see that the, the public is all on one side um, and the odds makers and the sharps are on that side um, and different sports books do it differently. Some, some trade off liability to where if they have a massive liability on one side, they will move. Um, mm -hmm. But I think a majority of the sports books see that um, even if they have a massive amount of liability on one side, but the sharps are agreeing with them and are on the other side, they're kind of happy to, to keep that line the same. Um, and so I think a lot of it comes down to, to that, that kind of thing with uh, some like primetime games and stuff like that. Like what's interesting now is like, there's such a, a battle between quantitative data and qualitative data and how that interacts with uh, sports betting. Like uh, for example, like I'm a, big quantitative guy, but qualitative data matters to me as well. Um, teams that are traveling on the road after Sunday night baseball are winning like 25% of their games right now. Mm. You wouldn't get that from quantitative data if you're just looking at, at team values and, and yeah. player values and, and mixing those as a whole. So it's really a mix of both, but I think that, you know, the data is the most important aspect of it. And for NFL, I would say it's even different than other sports because most of the odds makers that are coming up first with lines in the NFL have, have been doing it for 30, 40 years and are the sharpest people in the business um, that know their stuff. And, and, and that's kind of why you won't see major books have different point spreads for an NFL game. The industry is very much aligned and in tune with that. Whereas baseball, you might see a minus 120 favorite and uh, a minus 140 favorite at a different book. So um Different sports are different, but NFL as a whole, you know, is when I would say like where the, the market is kind of the market. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, when you think of your new job, you know, now you're at NASCAR, you and Joe kind of have a canvas, right? You, you, you're you kind of, you're really in some uncharted territories as this evolves, especially here in the U.S. Do you see, you know, staying on the technology topic and do you see AI and machine learning, you know, part of your future, you know, at NASCAR and, and looking at how you guys are going to evolve this this end of the business, your end of the business, and in, in looking at, at, at sports betting with NASCAR? Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, I think AI and machine learning are are definitely a component of that. I think, you know, even more like you kind of said it best is Joe and I have a blank canvas. Um, and right. I think that we're a really good team because, um, you know, he's been in the industry, in the sports betting industry for a long time and and has been in NASCAR for a little over a year and a half. And so he has that, that background where I come from the building models and pricing right. and, and market side of that. And so what we've been able to do is kind of combine our skill sets and our knowledge um, in knowing that we want to grow this sport because it's the second most watched sport in the U S which is right. surprising to a lot, but in terms of handle it's, you know, it ranks about 10th right now. And so what we're trying to really do is, is get that lever, you know, up and get it to, we know, we know it's not going to surpass the NFL or any of the core four sports, but um, in terms of markets that we can grow in, what we do is, is we look at data from other sports as well and see what is working in other sports. For example, 
in NFL, you can bet on on drive markets. Um, what's going to happen the next play? MLB, you can bet on the next pitch, the next at bat, and stuff like that. And so we're seeing these micro markets become so popular, um, and it's kind of a, a way of thinking of how do we incorporate na- you know that into NASCAR and you know incorporate those markets into NASCAR and, and make sure that operators see value in um, the growth that NASCAR can have not only from a viewership perspective, but from a betting perspective. And I think data is a huge part of that when we're learning about how many people are, are betting on micro markets and, you know, versus the spread and, and the fastest growing, you know, markets in different sports is, is all a big part of that. But, um, you know, I'd say AI and machine learning was more, more applicable to my previous role at DraftKings right. um, and using that than, than what it is now, but it's certainly a component of, of what we're, um, looking at each week at NASCAR. And, you know, outside of AI and ML, you know, those are, you know, kind of, uh, you know, some, you know, futuristic sounding things to to, to some people, right, who are not super technical. Um, what other um, uh, advantages do you have using technology? And, and you know, what are, what are some examples of, you know, technologies that you, that you have used uh, in the past and currently? Um, well, I mean, in the past, the DraftKings, I think like a, a huge thing that helped us out was sim models. And I think um, you see a lot of predictive analysts that are using sim models now, especially for pricing. Um, and it's interesting because really anyone can make their own NFL model. Anybody can make their own sport model that will price things out for them. Um, and whether you get ratings from that and run, you know, 10,000 sims to get a price or or try and find value. Um, that's something that I know sports books are using a ton now. Um, with the introduction of quantitative and 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 data and AI and machine learning that incorporate a lot of those statistics in there. And I think what's important is finding out which t- statistics that you want to incorporate into those models that you find important. Um, I'm a, a big hockey guy. And so, you know, you can look at hockey wins and losses and, and stuff like that. But what I think is more important are stats like high danger chances, um, expected goals for and expected goals against, um, you know, five on five opportunities generated versus the other team. Um, and so those data sets and like the more the saber metrics of baseball, you know, as they call mm-hmm. it, the, the more in-depth stats are are what we're finding are, are way better um, to use than kind of the outdated like ERA in baseball is not, you know, is so subjective to situations and is not, um, you know, the best way to really like look at someone's performance on the pitching mound, just as, as much as wins and losses as well. Um, so just the different data sets that we're using, um, to price things are, I would say the biggest change now, um, in the industry that you're seeing, maybe pricing is getting better for sure. Um, but it's also something that sharps have been using for for years with their own models that give them an edge on the books and that's why they have that edge it's interesting you i was just thinking about you know we were talking before we're when we're shooting this we're on the eve of kind of a couple big races you've got Boston Glen this weekend then daytona finishing up what are the variables that you guys look at going into let's say the weekend Right. When is when's the bet set? And when when is the when in NASCAR are you seeing people placing their bets and what are they looking at for that variable? What are they reading to say, okay, this is this is my guy uh that I'm gonna throw down this weekend on? Well, there's a couple of different things. I would say like ac- across sport wide, you'll you'll see that opening numbers are huge and opening lines are huge. Um sharps will often hit opening lines because they'll get an advantage um based on what the bookmaker thinks and, and find value there. Um what I would say that you look at at tracks. So this weekend we're at Watkins Glen, which is a road course. So you're looking at comp tracks to that. NASCAR is one of those where you're looking at comparables as you go to new races each week um, and new tracks each week. So for Watkins Glen, you're looking at road course uh, stats and you know how drivers have performed at previous road courses this year and, and previous road courses in previous years. And um, taking out major incidents is a huge thing in building a model that you have to do is if a driver's, you know, driving around half the race with, with damage on his car, like it's going to affect what his performance is and kind of what the data is giving you. So you have to look at that as well. And as you travel to Daytona, it's a super speedway. So what you'll see there is, you know, you have to look at Talladega, Daytona, um, and, and comp tracks like that. I also think, you know, 
NASCAR is different in terms of you have to look at tire wear tracks and um, banking as well. So wow. we were at Richmond last week, which is, which is a, a short flat track, a flat earth track. It's not completely flat. It actually has, you know, pretty decent baking, but for NASCAR, it's a, it's a flatter track and, and certain drivers perform a lot better at short flat tracks than they do um, high banking tracks and, you know, intermediate ovals. And so combining all that information and kind of grouping tracks together um, and, you know, whether that's asphalt or, or concrete and high tire wear versus low tire wear are all components that you, that I at least put into building my model and comparing, you know, track to track and, and how that driver I expect to perform that week. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's very, very interesting. So, you know, you, you really focus m more on kind of the advanced metrics than, you know, information that maybe uh, an average person w would look at um, or a casual uh, better. Yes. But I, I would, I, I would say, yes. I mean, I've always been <clears throat> a big saber metrics guy and looking at, um, you know, expected on, on base average and expected average and, and exit velocity in, in baseball. But what I think that we're seeing now is the, the market is maturing a ton and that, you know, the, the casual fan is starting to look at, at some of those more and realizing the value maybe than they did five years ago across all sports. Um, so I think that that is a huge advantage that we're seeing is that, you know, you, you learn the people that are, are very smart and very good at, at betting um, and predicting and what they're looking at is a lot of those advanced statistics and not the the ones that you, you kind of see on TV all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I was actually doing some research, uh, back to the AI, you know, ML topic. I was doing some re research around that and, and noticed that there's, uh, you know, quite a significant, um, number of open source platforms out there just focus on AI ML, which somebody who is savvy enough, you know, technically can actually, you know, just download it and, 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 uh, run it themselves. Um, do you hear about that or come across anything like that? Yeah, actually one of the things that I've been most excited for, um, like I said, baseball is my favorite sport. One of the things I've been most excited for was in a research project three or four years ago about an AI capability where, you could basically use CGI to um, replicate a pitcher's exact delivery using release point, um, stride length, uh, pitch velocity, and horizontal vertical break, et cetera, um, to replicate an exact pitcher's repertoire. And it is now being built out, or it was being built out. I think I just saw an article, I think that the Cubs maybe are using that now to where you can see like, you know, Kershaw's curveball. And instead of, you know, in a cage where you have uh, pitchers throwing curveballs or, you know, a machine like, you know, trying to replicate that, you can get basically his exact delivery, um, release point, stride length down to those pitches so that you're now seeing that teams are able to replicate exactly the pitcher that they're going to be facing and those exact pitches that they've seen. So for pitchers that are struggling picking up Kershaw's, you know, sliders as opposed to his fastball. You can work on that in the cage in a, in a way that you've never been able to before. Um, and it's going to be very interesting to, to see how that is utilized in, in baseball particularly, but it's such a cool thing that nobody would have thought possible 10 years ago that, you know, we're seeing now where you can literally replicate um, a pitcher on the mound, you know, with the exact same pitches is, is going to be something that, I think we'll bring averages up. I think it'll bring more scoring to baseball, but I also think that it'll help, you know, hitters who are struggling or, or might have low batting averages or success rates against, you know, certain pitchers and certain pitches. So that'll be super fun, but you'll see that across all sports. That's just one example where um, AI is really changing how I would say in player development a, a ton in all sports on how, you know, players are developing and, and approaching games. Yeah, I mean that, that, that's really interesting. Yeah, and and would they kind of take you know Kershaw for example? Um, would they replicate his motion by like some other pitcher <laughs> doing the same thing, or is it just it's all like machine based? There, no, yeah, like it's uh, it's I, I 
my understanding, I could be wrong, but I, uh, I'm pretty sure it's, it's a hologram of him actually pitching based wow, on like his, his data points and, and, and wow. videos that they have um, using, you know, his exact motion and, and delivery to a T. Oh, if that happens in baseball, it'd be a challenge to keep the uh, game time <laughs> to, to two hours like they're trying to, <laughs> if they're going to yes. be scoring more runs in the near future. Yeah, very cool. Uh, so, I mean, you just kind of went into like some of the things, uh, you know, we have to look forward to uh, some really cool things. Is there anything else that you see in the horizon in the next several years in, in the sports betting industry or in particular what you're doing with NASCAR? Yeah, I think you'll see a big change in NASCAR. I mean, you know, Joe and I have, have big plans to try and, and grow the sport and have had good success rates to do that. Um, you know, viewership is is up at NASCAR better than ever. And so, you know, we're, we're attracting a new fan base and um, really growing the sport by that. But I think sports betting is, is a huge component of that. And really what we've found across all sports is the more markets that you can offer, both pre-match and live, um, will directly correlate to, you know, keeping fans and users engaged that are betting on that platform. And so, um, you know, when you think about baseball, it's, it's a, it's a three hour game. If you bet on the spread, you have to wait three hours. So that's settled. If a team's down 10, Oh, you know, you, you probably lost You're you're disinterested and you're, you're looking away. But what I think is improved with baseball is you can bet on first five, um, yeah. you can bet on yeah. inning results and, you know, at bats and pitches, those tickets are settling so much quicker um, to where if fans are winning bets, they're going to stay engaged and keep winning. And if, and, and if they're losing bets, you know, they're more likely to not chase, but, you know, try and get their money back, you know, by a lot of those markets that settle quicker. And so you're seeing over a long game time that you can have hundreds and, and thousands of different bet types that settle throughout that game. So it's also, it's almost like you're watching many games um, that you're in tune with because once, you know, that at bat is over, it's kind of like your, your game is over because the bet is settled and you can move on to the next one. And so, um, you know, I would hope and, and, and I'm hopeful that in the future that you'll see more of that with NASCAR um, to help grow the sport and help grow handle um, as well, which I'm excited for. Yeah. Like, like one, one thing that I, seen more of lately and, and they keep getting me on this um <laughs> I, I think caesars is the one who, who does this where where they have a um you know a daily special um uh, that there will be no run scored in the first inning um across three games and you know to me it looks like oh it's a no-brainer right like it, it, you know how often is a, a run scored in the first inning I mean, I haven't won one of these bets. So it is it is more often than you think. Because if you're watching a ball game, you know, the first thing everybody's just kind of, you know, getting into the groove, they're getting loose. Like you don't see bombs, right, right away in the first thing. I mean, you, you do from time to time. But yeah, like they uh, they figure out how to how to get you with that one because you look at the pitching matchups, right? They, they look favorable. You look at the, the teams. Some teams are, you know, two, two bad teams playing one another. But there's always one team out of those three that will score a run in the first inning to get you. Well, it's funny that you mentioned that because <laughs> that's something that, that sports books and, and I think like uh, some some sharper betters have realized is that deep in the data sets, you see that sport scoring is actually higher in the first inning than than you would expect. And it actually I'm sure dips it down. Yeah. Russell doesn't know anything about baseball. <laughs> yeah. it, it He's been watching the Red the Sox too much this year. They don't score. Yeah. <laughs> so that um, actually decreases after the first inning? Is that yeah, because you're getting the top of the lineups in, in the first inning. Pitchers aren't oh, as fresh. Yeah. Once they settle in, you're getting, you know, the bottom half of the order. And then you see scoring kind of pick back up in like the fourth, fifth, and sixth as, you know, lineups turn around and lineups are seeing a pitcher for the second and, and third time. So um, but it's a, it's, it, th that's an example of a market that everyone loves. Everyone loves the no runs first inning. You know, like I only need six outs. I just need six outs. Like it's all, yeah, I need. right. <laughs> but it seems, it seems very simple. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of, uh, uh, data behind it that, you know, has kind of supported the scoring is kind of, you know, not at its, uh, you know, kind of at its peak in the first inning. Yeah. And then the odds think, are like over, plus 400 right so you know it's not in your favor right um yeah but you still and just, still just thinking juicy. of just thinking of that example that's why i think it's so exciting your current job 
with you, especially with you and Joe. No, have you know, we've had Joe on here before. He's a good friend. And and knowing what's in the head of you, I think it's really exciting because you can do this now with with NASCAR. There's so much you've you've the biggest fan base. They're so active. You know, I've been to races. You know, I grew up with a father-in-law that was obsessed with it. You know, that audience is all in and they're dialed in. And I think that kind of baseball analogy, you can flip over to NASCAR and your handle is going to is going to just go up, especially as we get all these markets in. Uh, yeah, 100 percent. You're, you're really sitting. You're really sitting in a great spot. Yeah, 100 well, percent. I, I, I appreciate that. And I think, you know, one of the small examples that we've done is like, you know, the, the same game parlays that you see all sportsbook have with, you know, within games is something that I brought to DraftKings a little bit in terms of we called them top finish parlays where you were able to parlay three drivers to all finish in the top five or the top 10 right. and um, get those higher payouts, like, you know, the plus four, plus 600 that, that betters, you know, like to see that, that number four. And so um, it really is an exciting time for us and and exciting that we have such a blank canvas that we can build around with an already established fan base that you said, like, is so dedicated. So um, it's super fun. And, and Joe and I have fun each day talking and brainstorming these ideas that, you know, will ultimately deliver on and, and bring more, uh, fan engagement and, and betting markets to the public. I think we'll have to, Russell, we'll have to get to a race and do our next interview with both Joe and, and Ray from the race, like we talked about with the headphones. On. Yeah, I think that sounds like a good idea for the, the follow-up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, like with those parlays that, that, that you mentioned, is that up to the sports book? Yeah, yeah. The sports book will kind of determine what, what markets they want to offer there. Um, and, and you know what they want to utilize in in terms of of parlays, um, and, and it's also tr- being fully transparent. It's very book friendly to offer parlays. Um, it, it, parlays is a, a high margin thing for books, so they can they can build in margin, and you just should probably be getting a better price than what you are actually getting. But um, it's hard to for betters to figure out, but also fun fun things to bet on. So. Um, Yes, it's up to the operators, but in general, they love offering, you know, those same game parlay type of things and um, parlays in general. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure it's wide open now with with racing. Just even thinking of the controversy between drivers and and what you just said about track speed and this and that, you can you probably come up with some fun parlays as well that will that will get you know some chatter online as well. Yeah, well, those have been great. Russell, that this is this has really been a great conversation. Yeah, it's, a, it's been a wealth of information. <clears throat> Excuse me, I lost yeah. my voice. Um, you saw me coughing there on mute. Yeah, <clears throat> but my voice is going. But uh, Ray, <clears throat> thank you so much for joining us. Um, this was great. Um, uh, Kevin, uh, as always, thank you as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you know, he was choking up because he was actually, you know, he had made some parlay bets right before this call he was talking about. Yeah. And uh, real, <laughs> realized that he probably just lost some money. Well, uh, I hope he was <laughs> <start> crying. <laughs> yeah, he was crying. He's no longer betting on baseball. Yeah. Move I, it I to NASCAR. Be... Move to NASCAR, Russell. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I appreciate the time, Russell and Kevin. Yeah. Thank you so much. And it's yeah, great. excited to uh do a follow-up with, with Joe and I at the track sometime when we can show off some stuff. That'd be that, fun. Uh, been working That'd be great. Yep, absolutely. All right, well, yep. good luck. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Ray. All right. Yep. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.